First of all, uh, good afternoon to everyone. Today's session is going to take around an hour and it's going to be focused on our, well, it's our MVP for open banking and trust webinar. Now, for those that are new to us, I want to greet you and welcome you. Uh, for our existing partners that are present and our customers, we appreciate your support for joining. Um, we appreciate your ongoing support for the vendors that we hold and the products that we have and the enthusiasm you've shown with us. And it's because of you that we're here today. Now, for those that are new, I uh, just want to do a little introduction uh, about the Colonel and myself. Uh, I myself am new to the Colonel, uh, only joined recently. And I basically head up business development in the Middle East and North Africa. The Colonel itself as a company has been operating in the region since around 2008. It started off in cybersecurity as a consultancy and basically developed into a value-added distributor that focuses on emerging technologies that specialize in authentication, identity management, and also forensics. We have another um, uh, number of offices globally, around 100 staff. Uh, we have offices in places such as Dubai, Moscow, Kiev, uh, Bangalore recently, and Ryder in, in Saudi Arabia. So obviously we've got quite a large global coverage. A little bit more from me about um, today's guests who you can see online. We have two guest speakers. Uh, the first one is Mike Schwartz, who is the CEO uh, for Glue and also their founder. He's based in Austin, Texas. So I really appreciate you getting out of bed early today. Um, Mike has got around two decades in, of experience in open source identity management. Um, Glue itself is the industry leader in this. It's a FAPI certified product and it implements things such as SAML, Open Off, uh, sorry, OAuth and OpenID Connect. Mike also is a, uh, an author and he wrote the 2018 A Press book, Securing the Perimeter, and he's the host of a podcast as well. Um, today, he's going to speak about identity federations. And once he's done, following him, we have Bupinder Singh, who's joining us from the UK. So not quite as early a start as him. And Bupinda basically brings a lot of expertise to the board today. He has successfully deployed open banking in countries such as Brazil and the UK. He's the CTO for a company called OpenID. Sorry. Uh, yeah, OpenIT, sorry. And while he does that as well as work for them, he is also the managing director of a company called Open Banking Initiative Canada. So he's spearheading different projects in different regions around the world as well. He's going to talk to you today about the ecosystem for open banking. Now, he's going to have another 20 minutes. Post Bupinda speaking, we're then going to hold a QA. and uh, a What I would ask for you to do is for any direct questions that you have, please put them in the chat and reference the person that you would like to answer the question. Um, that's enough from me. So I'm, I'm now going to hand over to Mike. So Mike, if you want to um, share your screen, that would be really appreciated. Sure. Yeah, if you could stop sharing. Okay. And share desktop one. Okay. So um, thank you, James, and thank you everyone for joining today. I know it's um, always hard to make time to join a, another um, Zoom meeting, but um, thank you. So today I wanted to start by talking about banking federations and how they are key to enabling open banking. So like James said, um, I am the author of a book uh, called Securing the Perimeter, which is about open source identity. And a lot of the content that I'm gonna talk about today is covered in chapter 10 of my book. So if you want a, a deeper dive, um, you can, um, you, you can um, read about 30 pages on this um, at some later time. I also host a podcast called Open Source Underdogs. You can find that on opensourceunderdogs.com. And that's a, actually not a technology podcast, but a business podcast about the business of open source software. And if you want to get a better understanding of, of how companies use open source as part of the business model, and then that's not just monetization, it also includes how 
to interact with customers in the community and what how to use open source software development to enhance your value proposition and and other aspects of the business model including monetization um, it's a, it gave me a much deeper understanding on the topic and we had some really great guests including the um, CEO of SUSE, the world's largest open source company, um, independent open source company now, and the CEO of Canonical, and about 48 or 50 other companies. So um, if you have a lot, spend a lot of time in traffic, not a bad way to spend it. So let's talk a little pivot to open banking here. Um, and I, I, just at a high level, I wanted to say the purpose of open banking, There, there's two that I think of. One is sharing data and the other is payments. So this is probably a vast oversimplification, but what sharing data, you could think of like new, new applications built by FinTech companies that allow you to see like how much you spent on eating out. Um, or if you run a business, you might have accounting software and you might say, oh, wouldn't it be great if my accounting software could just, you know, pull in all the information from my bank so I didn't have to enter it. So those applications are run by third parties. And and likewise with payments, if you pay your phone bill using your bank, the, the phone company is a third party. So a lot of open banking um, challenges are around how do we establish trust between banks and third parties. So when you, when you think of the ecosystem, there are really, I, I, I break it down into like three different categories of, of, of participants in the ecosystem. Um, the first is the bank who's holding your money and also your personal information. Um, there are FinTech companies or payment processors who want to interact on your behalf with 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 the bank, and then there's the the person or the consumer, and that person has an interest um, also, and sometimes is forgotten about, um, but that person really has their own interests. So, the the bank's main interest in this ecosystem is to protect their data, so they want to make sure only the right people can transact. You know, can um, also they want to they have an obligation to protect the privacy of their customers. So the fintech companies or payment processors want assurance. So if you're paying, if you're processing a payment, you want to know that that is actually, you're going to be paid. But also if you're relying on identity data from the bank, you want to know that the bank did a good job vetting that information. So the, the, Fintechs or payment processors are sometimes known as relying parties because they're relying on the bank to identity proof um, the customer. And the person wants, this is somewhat of an oversimplification, but the person wants control of their data. They want the right to update their data um, or to um, stop sharing their data with the third party if necessary. And if you know a little bit about the European regulations, the General Data Protection Regulations (GDPR), um, that's a, that's one of the best sort of um, expansions of how people should have an interest in the, in this sharing. But um, remember, these are all independent organizations. The bank doesn't run the fintech, and so they all have independent interests. So the question is, is in an open banking ecosystem, how do we formalize it? And this is done through through a federation. Um, so sometimes this term is used and, and people use it in different ways. But when, when I say federation, what I mean it is a group of autonomous entities who are ceding some of their um, ceding some of their power to an independent organization in to gain efficiency. Um, th this uh, is the dictionary definition that I got out of OED um, and talks about a federation, the United States. And if you think about the United States, each each state um, has its own laws, but the states sometimes cede um, power to the federal government, for example, for interstate commerce. They say, well, it's a f we could all make our own rules for interstate commerce, but by ceding authority to a central power, we can become more efficient. And so we have the same situation in banking 
where there's, um, you know, one bank can't tell another bank how to run their business, but yet we all need to work together. Um, the benefits of this in the banking ecosystem are a trust. This is really the one of the biggest ones is if you're a bank and you're going to release personal information to a fintech company, how do you know they're going to protect that data? Um, and how do you know that that or is a real company? So one of the things that the that the banking federation does is it vets all of the um, participants. So if you're a bank, you have to prove that you're a correctly chartered, you know, financial institution. If you're a relying party or you know a fintech or payment processor, you also have to show you know that you're a real organization and that you have a um, a legitimate reason to be in this ecosystem. Um, interoperability is one that we we think about a lot. If every bank has their own API for payment and sharing data, um, this is going to drive up the cost for everybody. So interoperability is a big one. Um, efficiency, both legal and technical efficiency is also really important. If every fintech has to make a one-to-one -one agreement with every bank in the ecosystem, this is really going to drive up costs and, and open banking is not going to work. Um, so those are just, in my opinion, sort of the three goals. So how do we achieve those goals? So this this is the slide with the most content on it. I'm not going to go through all of this, um, but I always talk about tools and rules. So the, the, the tools are the technical pieces that the Federation provides, and the rules are the operating processes and procedures, legal agreements, and all the other things that um, enable us to, to drive uh, trust. Um, so just to give maybe one example from each category, um, in the open banking ecosystems, there's this thing called the directory. Um, the directory is a system that publishes the keys, the cryptographic keys for each bank. Um, so instead of having to go to each bank and say, send me your keys, the, the um, open banking federation operator typically provide some type of technical service that the participants can go to in order to obtain the right the right key material. And this saves a lot of phone calls and a lot of emails um, um, in the process. Um, but um, just one more tool I can give an example of. Even the public website and the, and the developer wiki um, or the sandbox hosted by the um, Federation um, are examples of some of, some of the tools. Um, the rules, on the other hand, um, one of the most important rules is the participant agreement, um, because there are some, um, the laws of the land sort of lay out some of the rules, but in order to gain trust, we're going to need a little bit more specificity. And so that can be achieved through the participant agreement. And by having a standard participant agreement, um, if I'm a bank, I don't have to say, well, what agreement did this fintech company sign we know that all of the fintech signed the same agreement so we can expect the same sort of warranties and and liability protection um, so we don't have to worry you know one one to one evaluate the the legal um, um, sort of obligations of the parties um, but there's other um, um, the the rule both the tools and the rules really are what enable you to achieve you know, what I talked about before, which is trust, interoperability, and efficiency. So we've been um, making federations for a long time in the identity space and, um, and, and in the internet in general. So I wanted to talk about some of the different technical models to achieve this trust. Uh, the first one I like to talk about that everyone sort of knows about is, is hierarchical federations. So if you're familiar with DNS, there's a there's a top level domain and then you buy a domain name and then you you know within your domain you can create hosts um, so this is sort of a familiar hierarchical so the internet in a way is a big federation we've agreed to some technical standards we've agreed we're going to use tcp ip and we're going to use the dns protocol and we're going to use these registries and that's enabled us to achieve interoperability it hasn't enabled us to achieve much trust. And so just because you see a domain name doesn't really mean much anymore. Um, but however, it has driven interoperability. 
Um, there's other hierarchical um, federations. PKI is one. So you're probably familiar with getting a certificate from a, from a certificate authority. Um, so that's an example where you might have a root certificate that issues um, you know, certificates underneath it. And maybe a little more trivia, but there's a, a federation called Edurome. Um, this is a higher ed federation where you can go to any campus that's a member of Edurome and log on to their Wi-Fi. And so there's sort of a trust relationship between um, these universities, um, you know, we trust you to log on to the Wi-Fi, but there's also a technical system that um, routes the authentication back to your home campus. So um, if I'm at, let's say, University of Texas and I go to, um, you know, a school in Europe, um, the authentication goes back to Texas. So Europe doesn't have to, the European school doesn't need to have every single username and password for every college. So. The next type of federation is, is really what I call a proxy federation. And this can be very efficient for both the banks and the websites um, because the proxy, the proxy federation uh, or the existence of a proxy in the federation sort of um, is like a clearinghouse for, um, for technology. And um, a great example of this is a company called SecureKey in Canada. So from the bank's perspective, they sign up with SecureKey. From the website's perspective, they sign up with SecureKey. And once they do that, the website can offer a login from any bank. Um, so this is great for, the, um, um, for both the banks and the, um, um, and the websites. The one challenge with this is that um, SecureKey in the middle sees everything um, and also becomes sort of a, a, a um, very sort of they're in the path for everything. So the criticality of their service is really high. So you get simplicity, but you also get um, maybe secure key seeing a little bit more data than, than would be ideal here, um, but we trust secure key. So this can be a good approach. Um, it also has its limitations. Um, and then the last type of federation I'd like to talk about is called meshed. Um, in these federations, we have a federation operator who publishes what's called the metadata aggregate. Um, so this is basically, it's a list of everyone who's in the federation, their cryptographic keys and the services that they provide. And um, each IDP and website, or you know, each bank and FinTech, if we're using, you know, sort of looking at examples, um, must um, sort of decide who they trust but in doing so, they have sort of an automated way to configure it. Um, so this, this is a very popular model in the higher education space. So you might have heard of uh, federations like Edugain in Europe and InCommon in the US. Um, these have you know, thousands of universities and, and government agencies um, also in the US. Um, we have a huge federation in, in sort of the um, law enforcement, Department of Justice. So there's a number of these um, type of mesh federations and they've been working well for us for years um, in the SAML space. So, um, so all this was sort of out there. And then um, the UK Banking Federation really was the first one to sort of say, how do we bring this federation technology into the open banking space and sort of modernize it? Um, and what they created was a mesh federation, both it's sort of a mix of a mesh and a hierarchical federation. Um, it's a mesh federation because they are, um, um, they're using a directory to publish information about the participants. And to a certain extent, um, the, just because a FinTech is in the federation doesn't mean the bank will, um, the, there's any, any exchange of data. Um, so it's really a way to drive interoperability, um, but it's still up to the, um, so here's a good example. There might be uh, a thousand banks in the ecosystem, but maybe a certain FinTech only wants to work with eight of them. So there's no, re there's no requirement that just because you're a FinTech, you have to support all the banks. Um, so trust is still sort of left up to the participants, you know, who to trust. But it, once you decide to trust somebody, there's a standard way to sort of get that information. Um, 
And it's also, there's some aspects of hierarchical federations um, in the open. So it's particularly, they're using a certificate, certification authority or certificate authority um, to issue um, certificates and to do signing. Um, so there is some centralization of, of, of trust um, here. Um, and so I just wanted to point out some of the firsts, the OB firsts. Um, so OB is the Open Banking Implementation Entity. That's the name of the UK Banking Federation. Um, they were the first um, um, banking federation um, to use OpenID. So previously, the federations in this space had all been based on SAML. And, and OB sort of looked at SAML and said, you know what, um, there are too many problems with SAML to, to um, support the level of um, assurance that banks need. Um, SAML had, didn't mitigate enough risks, and so they needed a more modern um, um, identity protocol, and they selected OpenID. And then they looked at OpenID and they said, OpenID is great, but actually we need you to use OpenID in a certain way. Like OpenID has supports a range of trust models from low assurance to high assurance. And they said, if we're gonna use OpenID, we need you to use these features. We need you to use a certain type of encryption and signing, and we need the requests to, to, cut, to be formed in a certain way, and we need the responses to be provided in a certain way. And so, um, so OB was also really critical in the development of what we call FAPI, which is the financial grade API. It's basically the profile of OpenID um, for um, financial services. Um, another first, maybe it's a little geeky, but I, I think it's really interesting, is that um, OB was the first to use something called OAuth software statements. So one of the questions that really arose early on was how are we gonna onboard um, fintechs? And so in a traditional you know, developer experience, the developer says, oh, I need to call your APIs. Can you issue me client credentials? Can you give me a client ID and a client secret? And so um, OB sort of looked at this and they said, you know, if we're gonna wait for banks to issue um, um, client IDs and secrets to fintechs, there's going to be a holdup. Um, it's, it's going to be a manual process and it's going to, it's going to be an impediment to the ecosystem. And so uh, OB defined a mechanism called software statements, which is like a, it's like a token that can be obtained from OB and presented by a fintech to a bank. And it says, OB trusts me, can you give me client credentials? Um, so it's a way to automate sort of the provisioning of fintech and payment processors, but the OAuth statement conveys the trust of OB. So it, it says, OB, trust me, you should trust me too. So it was a really innovative mechanism. It's really the first time we've seen software statements uh, used like this, and it's been replicated in, in other um, um, banking ecosystems. So... That is sort of my federation overview. I think Bupinder is going to go more into detail sort of on how we use this federation. And he's going to talk, um, give really just um, a more detailed view. I wanted to say a couple of words about glue because I've been talking really about all this abstract stuff. You're probably wondering what the heck does glue do? So I just have a couple of slides at the end about us. Um, so glue is a software vendor. We provide a open ID provider. So that you can use to implement or to protect the open banking APIs. So as I've been talking a lot about trust and the way that trust gets established is through the use uh, issuance of tokens. So glue is, the, is basically the thing that issues the tokens um, in this ecosystem. And we've created a profile of the glue server for open banking. So when you deploy, um, like the glue server can be used for all sorts of authentication um, requirements. Um, so you can use it to protect a gaming website, a, a retail website, a you know workforce website. But we said banks have these really specific requirements for open banking. 
So instead of having you deploy a generic glue server and then do 50 different configurations to make it, you know, what you need for open banking, we created a distribution called the Open Banking Identity Platform, which is a glue server sort of pre-configured for open banking to make deployment easier. Um, and um, so as um, James mentioned, we are based on open source. Um, we believe that open source is just a good way to write the software and that um, we're in an ecosystem like, like financial services where we're talking about trust, that actually there's a saying that nothing builds trust like source code. And so, um, you know, ultimately, the, the, when you look at the product of Glue, the product is the code plus the binary distributions um, plus the deployment instructions like the, you know, Kubernetes and stuff like that, um, um, plus the documentation, plus the support. So the product is all that stuff together. The code is just how you write the software. And what we feel is that the open source development methodology for open, for, for software based on open standards, that the open source development methodology leads to the best software and the most innovation. And that's why we chose it. Um, but it's really separate. It's a part of the product and it's a part of the business model. Um, um, Glue is really on the cloud native bandwagon. So by that, I mean that we believe in containerized deployments and a lot of um, automation around, de around the deployments and auto scaling and sort of um, all of the things that you expect with sort of a cloud um, deployment. And this can be on public cloud or private cloud. So we sort of see, or hybrid cloud, maybe your cloud plus the public cloud is backup. But we're still talking about a deployment that you control, um, but deployed on sort of cloud, uh, cloud technology stack. Um, and I guess the last differentiator for Glue is that, especially in supporting the cloud, we wanted to support cloud databases. So we, we, we have a number of database options at Glue. Persistence ends up being like one of the hardest parts of deploying something like the Glue server. So we give you some options, but if you're going cloud, we really recommend going with a cloud database. Um, Amazon Aurora um, or Google Spanner are, are two that come to mind, but, um, but we really think that drives down operating costs is like one less thing to think about, but it's a big thing. So that's, I think that's hopefully about 20 minutes. Hopefully I didn't go over too much. And um, let me hand it over to Bupinder, who's really an open banking guru and we'll, we'll really tell you a lot more about open banking than I did. So thank you. Thanks, and Mike. I'm going to try and stop sharing. Yep. Thank you. If you can confirm, if you can see my screen. Yeah, yeah, we see your screen. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I'm Bhupinder Singh, uh, and I'm CTO at OpenIT. Uh, so we specialize in open banking based solutions, and uh, I will try to explain a bit more on open banking uh, side, especially in the implementation, the trust framework, um, and uh, how did various jurisdictions did uh, in terms of open banking implementation. Um, so without further delay um, I will go to my first slide so um, I think you know as the open banking has evolved in various uh, geographies around the world um, I suppose this question is still relevant uh, you know uh, what was what's the difference between uh, not being open banking enabled country or jurisdiction how can somebody say actually this country is open banking so I in, in very general terms I have you know um, created this slide um, explaining like in this is my opinion that what open banking uh, probably should look like or feel like. Um, so historically and traditionally, you know, uh, screen scraping has been the prime modus operandi of getting data out of the bank interfaces or or any IT system uh, since the evolution of internet. Um, and there are a lot of propositions or applications which still exist or even use it today. The screen scraping as the uh, you know preferred method of getting data. Uh, out of any system, maybe a uh, you know bank portal or any other website. Um, so, but what has changed with open banking? Uh, quite few big fundamental things, which I believe are very important and uh, should must be recognized. 
Um, so the first one is uh, the big one is that now the data sharing, uh, which happened between a bank or a fintech or a third party application is to use uh, APIs, right? These are the specific API into application uh, interfaces. Uh, it, it, I believe are mostly rest based, uh, but obviously there could be other interfaces available. So the data exchange is in um, whether it is about the account transaction or making a you know payment initiation. Those all trigger with the use of APIs. Um, so obviously uh, APIs are platform agnostic. They can be consumed on any devices, and uh, and I suppose they are also developer friendly in terms of development, right? So in all in all, the API first is one of the the main uh, trait of open banking, right? The second one, which obviously is the, uh, the, the positive impact of when you get rid of screen scraping is that, you know, the credential, the, the, uh, the fundamental of every security standard or every secure device is being used in a password historically and even today, right? So when you use API along with open banking system enabled, uh, you know, which I will explain how it was solved using open ID connect uh, profile, the customer credentials are never meant to be left or submitted on third party system. They are in full control of the customer and they are always submitted to the, uh, the bank interface, right? So in that case, you know, FinTech or third party never see to get to see the, the credential, customer credential, which obviously was the downside of screen scraping. And lastly, but I would say again, the most important thing which has happened due to the development of open banking is explicit customer consent model, right? Uh, consent um is an extension the way i see it is it's like you know um, uh, how you can link or authorize some third party to access some data and you still see the permissions and uh, you know uh, what you are exactly sharing whether it is for sharing data or whether it is for money movement right so consent is uh, i would say one of the important um uh, byproduct of open banking which has happened right so in all in all, I usually say, so these are my, you know, uh, traits, what I say, open banking enabled, APA first, uh, ba banishment of screen scraping uh, and explicit customer consent. Uh, and all together, you know, the, the data transfer is seamless. Uh, it is, uh, it could be consumed on any channel and any platform. Uh, so moving on from there, um, this is what I believe is uh, happened when open banking is delivered, right? Um, so there are some acronyms which I will, you know, just quickly mention. So these are the terminology which UK has used heavily. So for example, ASP is the account information service provider. Uh, it is like to say a FinTech or a TPP who is uh, doing account aggregation, right? Then there is a payment initiation provider, which could be used to pay your bills. So basically they are dealing with the payment services. Um, there is another category, which is little less known. It's called card-based instruments. Uh, these are the companies who would probably store your credit card or debit card, uh, and then you know do a transaction. I think good example is PayPal, right? Um, so if PayPal has to become a, a fintech and a TPP, a licensed one, then they would probably need to acquire a CBB based a regulated license. But what overall open banking driver look like is that, you know, if a government or a country achieves it, um, so this is the regulated model. Obviously, uh, this can't be achieved by market led or industry led initiative. So government and regulator establish a policy or a framework which in Europe happened to be PST2, which was put by the European Commission. And then that get translated into a technical standard implementation uh, standard, what was called as RT as regulatory technical standards. Um, but, uh, but that's not uh, still sufficient uh, to you know, help drive the control and security. And GDPR uh, plays a very important role in open banking, whether it is acknowledged or not, uh, because uh, the whole idea of sharing information and then actually be able to translate into an implementation, uh, those rules of the game are still uh, you know, effective or uh, appropriate, even in the open banking world. So from top down, so government and regulator, consent and privacy laws, and then comes the, I would say, the industries or the organization who are facilitating the technical architecture. 
So as Mike said that, you know, UK was the first to do what we call federated directory for open banking. So what I've done the central directory, then there are certificate authorities. This is exactly like a PKI. Then you have integrator, which could be middle uh, system enablers. And finally auditor, which could be again a regulator, you know, who would like to see uh, how banks and their various organizations have performed. So all in all, you know, the, the bottom diagram just try to explain that, you know, there are account providers, which could be banks, uh, credit unions, or e-money institutes, uh, which uh, provide APIs. Uh, they could choose API of a type based on which category they belong to. So they could have published account APIs, payment APIs, and credit card APIs. Um, and obviously FinTech can consume and, you know, uh, publish a value prop on various channels mobile devices and, uh, and all in all this has you know uh, translated into uh, uh, more consumer uh, oriented products and you know services okay so this path to open banking which i have depicted is mostly based on my understanding and you know uh, experience working with the uk and the european uh, standards especially with the uk um, so in no particular order uh, although this is sequence but they could have happened in parallel but I feel that these are the very basic fundamental building block which any country or uh, uh, country need to solve uh, in order to you know uh, get uh, define the uh, open banking landscape in their in their country. Um, so, for example, as I said, like consent technical standards, they are the first one uh, which need to be you know addressed, uh, which could be split against a government a regulator or even independent custodians, right? So who defines this? It's uh, not the question which I'm trying to answer, but saying this is um, what is required as a raw material to, you know, reach to open banking enabled country. Uh, APA standards, uh, which are very important. So what we have seen is that uh, some of the countries and jurisdiction have developed their own. A uh, few have taken leap um, or, you know, a chapter out of other justification and said, okay, we're not going to implement our or design a new API standard. Why not just reuse? Because one good thing happened um, in open banking is, uh, which Mike will obviously appreciate also, is that, you know, the standard definitions which are published by TSD2 or UK regulatory, they are all open source license. So any country anywhere in the world can reuse them and make to fit. So, which is good part that work done in one part of the uh, one part can be reused anywhere, right? So that's the reusability of the APA specification. Um, security standards, which uh, Mike briefly alluded to, that the SAPI model again, that's Open ID Foundation. So that that can be that can be you know uh, 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 that can be reused anywhere in the world, uh, you know, uh, by anybody. So. Security, defining the security standard is very important because otherwise um, none of the APIs or open banking can be enabled. Uh, customer experience guideline is a very important part, which I think is uh, assumed a lot, but it's a very hard one to solve. Now this talks about actually, how does the real bank customer uh, onboard a service, interact with the service, uh, even deprovision a service from a FinTech. So all those things, are actually in the visual representation are defined in the customer experience guideline, which you can happen to be written writing one. You know, um, without the customer experience guideline, uh, I think open banking would be uh, fragmented because each bank would define could define their own experience guidelines, and I believe that would have been a bad show for open banking because uh, this this doesn't you know uh, adhere to the standards of open banking uh, experience. So guidelines of how the mobile interaction will happen, number of steps, um, and they should be no different from an organization A to B, uh, you know, in case of banks. So uniform experience can only be achieved if all the banks and fintechs adhere to the same um, framework of uh, or guideline framework. So that was the customer experience guideline. Um, Central directory, which I think uh, I will explain in a subsequent slide, uh, is the pivotal part of enabling the trust ecosystem uh, without which, you know, I think um, it's a bit hard job to enable open banking and have a secure, uh, secure by design or what we call private by design approach to the participation and trust can be end to end from the download of the app to the actual consumption of the FinTech app. You know, that's all can be delivered by the open banking uh, central directory ecosystem. Uh, 
Another important aspect is that um, uh, KPIs are required, whether it is regulated or unregulated, right? So what we have seen is that without KPIs, you know, the key performance indicators, which will define how good or, or bad open banking is behaving, because at the end of the day, the data has been flowing from bank to fintechs, but can we measure it, right? Can we, can we publish some statistics? So um, good part is that, you know, UK publishes quarterly KPIs for the API performance from various banks. And not, it, it not only tells the industry and the ecosystem how much data has moved, but also how each bank has performed. So obviously there are rigorous bench lines to, for the SLA that how, uh, how SLA for the API response, uh, fault tolerance, uh, you know, resilience. So all those have been defined in the KPIs, which again, make a vital part. Um, and I think the last two are obviously our enablement of our sandboxes, because uh, what we have seen is without the sandboxes, um, it's very hard for FinTech to try a value prop uh, and sandboxes are the innovation hub. Uh, so this is the test bed where they can, you know, try their ideas uh, and, uh, you know, uh, change their approaches and launch, uh, you know, a good proposition to the market. Um, lastly, what we felt is that uh, milestones are very important and phased approach could be, right? So uh, we will talk about a little bit about read versus write APIs, which are also important, you know, in the open banking world. Uh, so... Uh, this is uh, the depiction of uh, very closely representing what I call is open banking ecotrust system, which Mike mentioned as the central directory. Um, so it's, uh, uh, it's obviously very different to what probably kind of secure keys um, in a sense that actually uh, the trust system only enable organizational data sharing, right? It means that can organization A be trusted by organization B based on just digital credentials, right? Um, and uh, the arrows, if I have to explain, as you can see, uh, the consumer on the extreme left-hand side, the arrow just depict that actually consumer would know the banks, its own banks, and a trusted fintech. And the data is flown from a bank to a fintech ecosystem, not via the central directory, but directly between the institutes. But what happens is that, you know, the, the central directory, which is the anchor point, it is a, it's a trust provider. So basically it, very, it is like an entry point, right? So it enables uh, or it gathers the data uh, in a digital format from various public entities. It could be company register, it could be regulatory register like a NCA or what we call National Competent Authority in UK, what we know as FCA. Um, and it could be certificate providers as well, if there's a, that's the European model, right, where the PST2 certificates or EIDA certificates are distributed. So central directory is just an enabler, but it gives immense power and control that, um, you know, we can prove end-to-end -end, uh, non-repudiation, right? You can really track the onboarding of a fintech to the consumption of the fintech and, you know, everything can be, you know, uh, proven if needed in the law, uh, in the court of law. Um, so, as I said, like it is an enabler, right? It, it enables the trust relationship between the bank because um, the, each bank who will publish their uh, well-known endpoints, I'm just going to a bit of the implementation, the open ID connect um, part, and then, you know, FinTech can discover. Um, the software statement, which Mike alluded to, are part of how uh, a TPP can generate a SSA uh, using APIs and then present to the bank interface to register themselves as an application client. So all those, uh, you know, uh, the enabler part is the byproduct of implementing a central directory. And as I said, like, it is a really important component in UK open banking, and it has been a model which UK adopted. It's the same model what uh, Brazil has taken forward, uh, almost equivalent. They have the same approach. Uh, and, you know, regulators are happy because they can really control uh, or see the participation of the fintech. So no unsolicited illegitimate participation from the fintech. And uh, a directory can also publish the trusted seal marks on the apps saying that these are the trusted fintechs, right? So all in all that, this is a centralized way a country can enable, uh, you know, a trusted ecosystem for open banking. Uh, the next one, I will just briefly talk about a bit about the identity and consent, conscious of time. 
Um, so identity and consent are linked together in open banking because without one, another cannot exist. So identity is a way where how customer prove its uh, you know uh, uh, legitimacy or you know holder of the credentials. Uh, it could be username, password, or multiple factors. Whereas a consent is the explicitly saying that you know how do you uh, what permissions you grant to uh, uh, what permissions you grant to the uh, the, the participating fintech. So uh, identity and consent are very important in open banking and uh, I've just highlighted uh, how they are related and uh, various type of consents can be, you know, um, presented uh, for the various type of authorization based on account aggregation or in the, or for the payments use cases. Uh, FAPI security, again, I will just touch base briefly. Um, so FAPI security is the, the profile of OpenID Foundation which drives the security of all the APIs. So it is a, it's a mix, uh, it's, a, it's a composition of the standards. Uh, OAuth2, OpenID Connect, you know, these are the, the, the base uh, frameworks which are used. And on top of it, there is extensions profile used to, you know, uh, which provides the FAPI security. Um, in addition to what UK has started as a security profile, now Brazil has adopted a bit more rigorous and a bit more refined approach to the authorization, you know, using PAR and JAM. These are the, the security standard which enable fine grain authorization requests, right? So in it, what it means is that FinTech can actually tell the, the banks uh, that what authorization level they need. And then the authorization server, which happen to be a bank can, you know, decide whether to allow or deny. Um, so that's one important addition. CBA is a, a new, uh, not really new. It has been existing standard in the telephone uh, in the telephony world, but it has been used to enable what we call offline or point of sales communication. So open banking, the first phase was to enable drive innovation on the web channel mostly, but the use case of payments, which is especially to deal with that, how can um, a customer pay with a mobile app uh, when he or she is a point of sales because there is no web interface. So SIBA, what we call is the, uh, the you know, client side uh, push authorization or back channel, you know, push authenticate authorization. It enables the, uh, you know, uh, the authorization of a type, uh, a payment, any payment initiation type for the use case of uh, point of sales, uh, which has been adopted by, you know, uh, as a part of FAPI security. Um, the, so this is the reference architecture, which uh, we have worked on. We have working sandboxes uh, model available for us. Um, so I will just quickly run past our reference architecture. Um, so a lot has been learned within the open banking for, you know, for uh, what I have experienced at delivering the projects in UK for big CMA9 and for Brazilian market. Um, it's not an API problem. So let's just, let me call it out. It's a more than a, just an API problem. Um, there is a lot going on security side. APIs are no good if you cannot secure them. So typically the, the, the sandbox which we propose or which we have uh, them already is, is a combination of an API gateway uh, integrated with um, a rock solid you know, access manager. In this case, uh, Blue is our partner and we believe that Blue has world reading software. It is innovative, it is adaptive, adaptive to the world, uh, the cloud standards, and uh, we can really you know, uh, make it fit to integrate with any API gateway and make it secure implementation. Um, so, and we also support the strong customer authentication using the glue stack. Um, so this is, as I say, like just a reference architecture uh, where a FinTech, uh, you know, have a three main steps. You, you authenticate and authorize against a access manager. You get some tokens and identity tokens, which you can play against an API gateway. The API gateway validates those tokens um, through the glue server and give you access to the data. Uh, along with, uh, during the authentication phase, which I think one thing which I missed is that MFA. So we can provide the strong customer authentication, which is the second factor. Um, in UK and Europe, it has been mandated, but it has been not totally implemented. I think the time scale has been just moved on, but uh, we believe that MFA is critical to enable the open banking uh, journeys because it gives you stronger trust 
factor or you know more reliable uh, trust in the system and uh, consumers feel safe about you know sharing the data in that way uh, I think that brings to my last slide. It's just about few uh, open banking benefits, which I would not read, uh, conscious of the time. So I would make a stop here and over to Rami and team for Q and A's. Thank you, Peter. Very appreciative. Really good slide, and, and thank you, Mike, as well. Um, what we're going to do now is move to our uh, Q&A. Um, so what I'd like to do with that is take the chance to invite anyone that has a specific question, uh, just to basically put it in the chat uh, and direct it to the person who you'd like to answer the question or have the question for. I have a question for Bifinder. Um, yeah, Mike. TPP, what does that stand for? Uh, so TPP is a, a term which describes like a third party providers. Um, so third party provider being a fintech in, in, in normal words, but uh, the regulatory bodies uh, prefer to call them TPP and then they will probably give some kind of a license TPP. So the terms which I mentioned like ASP, PSP or CPP, so TPP can acquire a license uh, to operate in those uh, on those role types. So in, in other words, it's just a, another word for a fintech. Um, if, if no one has a question, I have another question too. Can you, Bipinder, can you talk about some of the, where OB started and what are some of the new services that they're introducing? Um, so OB, when it started, you know, um, it was obviously ahead of uh, when uh, Europe was doing PSD2, because when Europe was doing PSD2 RTS, it was not out. OB started with the API specification. And obviously the idea was that uh, UK would have a, uh, a closed network as like a full end-to-end -end trust ecosystem for open banking. And later it will be merged to support PSD2 uh, because I think four or five years ago, we were, UK was still part of the European Union. Uh, unfortunately, now we are not. Um, but the approach was that uh, OB will be the foundation uh, entity which will put uh, you know, uh, a common standard for the big nine banks, uh, standard security profile, customer experience guidelines. So all those, uh, you know, the main component which I described in my, one of my slides were the, you know, uh, byproduct of OBIE. Uh, so they not only define the API specifications, they also define the security profile and also they enable the, the ecosystem by putting the open banking directory in place. Great, but um, they've introduced some new um, 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 enhancements. Yeah, sorry. Um, I that, but yeah, so so uh, so it was phased approach. So account APIs, then uh, payments APIs, but now they have introduced what they call is premium APIs as well. So again, you know, uh, premium APIs are something which a bank may choose to implement, and they can charge fintech or TPPs to consume, right? Um, and it's uh, it's optional APIs, uh, you know, a lot of them, uh, and uh, it was. Uh, uh, as such, uh, you know, uh, direction from the FCA that actually banks can leverage the same infrastructure to make ROI on the investment um, because it was a regulatory project. So it, it, it need, uh, so the, the, uh, uh, the paid APIs or, you know, premium APIs are, I would say a side effect of a delivering a technical stack, which could be reused in a uh, you know, number of ways. Um, and obviously there has been advancement in standards. Now UK security profile is no longer um, in existence. Every bank is actually certified to FAPI standard, which is a, a FAP open ID under open ID. Thank you for that. Um, just to check, does, does anyone else have any questions? Please feel free to to put them in the chat. Um, maybe you have a specific question regarding glue outside of open banking. 
please feel free to ask that as well while we have Mike. Okay, one from Davin Cook. Uh, this is for Bupinda. Two questions, actually. One for Mike and Bupinda. So we'll go through Bupinda's first. Uh, where would you suggest an integrator interface? What level or role would a bank to initiate the conversation on open banking? Who is in charge of meeting these objectives? Please, Bupinda. That's a good question, Davin. So, um, so see, the most of the objectives are actually regulated and mandated on the bank, unfortunately. Uh, um, and uh, the guidelines for banks to adhere to a standard are being defined in the law and their implementation in part of the technical standards, right? Um, so unless bank meet those, uh, FinTech wouldn't be able to operate or TPP wouldn't be able to operate. So as I say, like most of the heavy work is with the banks to make sure that standard or the implementation is in, the, in line with standard um, and they need to get a compliance certificate, right? But uh, recently there has been now push uh, by the regulator for uh, actually, uh, you know, validating the implementation of the fintech, which is good because uh, now uh, FCA or the the competent authority not only just ask for open banking to, you know, uh, get certified from standards body, they are also asking a compliance certificate that if the client is doing enough security uh, vetting and the implementations uh, and they are adhering to the implementation standard. Brilliant, thank you, Papinda. Um, Mike, for you from Davin, what opportunities are there for an integrator to lead with a CIAM, IAM project to bank if there are no if sorry if there is no mandate for open banking in the country where they're working? Yeah, and maybe I'll take the the next one too because I see we're a three minute warning and um, there was another question aside from open banking. What are the other major use cases and in industries who may have a need for glue? So I'll sort of, sort of combine those and say. Um, open banking is a very specific use case around complying with regulators requirements for, um, um, you know, security for these APIs. But um, if you, if you, if you, if there is no such open banking ecosystem, glue um, um, is commonly used for um, um, centralizing authentication for both consumer and workforce. So, um, so some of the other examples, a good place to start is always um, rolling out a modern authentication service um, for consumers or workforce um, examples. The other industries that Glue is active in, um, we work with large enterprises, so government, telco, healthcare, um, financial services, um, consumer facing, logistics, um, th those are the typical markets. Um, for example, um, there, um, the city of Dubai is one of our customers, and so the city of Dubai um, off supports strong authentication. There's a Dubai authentication mechanism and a UAE authentication mechanism that they support in their websites. So Glue actually presents the login page that validates against those credentials when you go to um, a municipal uh, site. So government is a, is a big use case for us. Um, we're doing a lot with digital driver's license. So how do you use your mobile phone to authenticate? Um, and, um, you know, also single sign-on mobile authentication. Um, Glue is also very strong. Um, there's been a lot of advances in using your phone as a platform authenticator. So using Touch ID to authenticate to websites. So generally, when you need to put the user through a workflow um, for authentication, um, you want to use something like the Glue server for that because you don't want to do it in every app. You sort of want to define authentication workflow in one place and then let other um, applications you, you reuse that so you, so you don't have to reinvent the wheel. And I see there's one more question, um, James. Yeah, that's from uh, Lawrence Dinger. Can these OB standards APIs used globally or only specific to the UK banking sector? Papinder, you want to take that? Sorry, Mike. Uh, I, can you please repeat? Sorry, I got distracted with really. uh, so Just while you're answering that, 
I'm going to put the contact page on as we're coming to the end, as you said. Yeah. So the question was, could you use open banking APIs and standards for other industries, or for, or maybe if if you're if the yeah. if there is no open banking ecosystem, does it make sense to wrote to align with these API standards? And um, so what we have seen, at least in you know part of Latin America, that irrespective of if it is not regulated, banks are looking to do APIification, okay? Um, and this API is not just to provide data to third parties. You can reuse these APIs to even uh, provide data to first parties. So if you ask me, technically, it's possible to share, uh, use the same APIs to even to share the data with the first party, which could be a group of banks sharing data among each other, developing their own close proposition. So definitely in that sense, it can be used. But again, you know, uh, it's just a technology piece, right? Uh, I can, in that sense, definitely you can reuse uh, enabling it. Uh, and as I said, like, if you have a core infrastructure available, then you can definitely extend it to publish more APIs. But certainly there is a, there is a use cases which we have seen in Latin America where a group of credit unions or a group of banks want to enable open banking among themselves. Yeah, and I think um, you know one of the benefits of open of these APIs is that a lot of thought and discussion and corner cases went into the design of these APIs. So if you're designing an API um, to do something similar, you could do worse than align with what with the work that they've done, and that will probably get you you know pretty close because a lot of the ecosystems that are popping up are really pretty close to um, the pattern that we've seen. So it's really not a bad idea. Um, to um, to leverage the work that's been done. And as Bupinder mentioned, um, all the work is published. It's all publicly available and under a open license. So it can be reused without any IP issues. So they've, they've really, share, you know, the UK, I think I heard that they spent like 80, 80 million pounds or something developing open banking. And so, um, so a huge amount of effort and money went into developing these, and they did a fantastic job. So I think that this, a lot of this work really can be reused. Okay, brilliant. <clears throat> Thank you both for that. Um, shall we call this to an end if no one else has any other questions? Okay. Brilliant. Okay. Well, we'll call it an end. Uh, thank you very much both for your time. We really appreciate that. Thank you everyone for joining. Um, what you can do if you have any further questions or any thoughts, if you want to get into communication with us, please use the um, info at the kernel.com email address that you can see on the final slide uh, or feel free to contact us via our office. Um, we're happy to assist with any, any ideas that you have. Um, and again, thank you so much for joining. Thank you. Thank you. Thank John. you, James. Fine. Brilliant. Okay.